Welcome to your daily growth book overview. We are now in chapter 11 of the book of Mark. Here we start with Jesus entering Jerusalem. We're getting ready for the crucifixion that he prophesied to his disciples over and over. I don't think they got it yet, but the moment is ready to happen. Now Jesus is ready to enter Jerusalem and he's preparing for his entry because his entry has to be done exactly the way it was prophesied. When Jesus would enter Jerusalem, it was prophesied that he would enter in, in Jerusalem on a donkey. Think about it. He was coming, he's a king of kings and lord of lords, but he was coming at, on a donkey. What did that represent? It represented that he would come in peace, not in war. There's actually prophecies that Jesus would come on a white horse, but there's two comings. The first coming, he came as a servant to die and suffer for our sins, to serve mankind. And Jesus said it in scriptures earlier that we've read that he said, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve. And he also came to love. And Jesus said this, no greater love has one man for another, but to lay down his life for them. Jesus is now preparing. He's coming in on a donkey. So he sends his disciples to get the donkey. This donkey was prepared. Think about it before the world began, really, this donkey had a purpose. And this donkey was never ridden. And it, Jesus was going to be the first one to ride this donkey. Jesus sends his, his disciples to the city and he says, go find a donkey. And this is what it says. As soon as you enter, this is in verse, verse two, as soon as you enter um, it, the city, you will see a a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden, untie it and bring it there. If anyone asks, what are you doing? <clears throat> Just say, the Lord needs it and will return and, re and will return it soon. This donkey was prepared. It was prophesied that that donkey would be there. When God sends us to do ministry, we have to also understand this is a ministry tip that God will always have the provision there for the ministry. When we say yes to what God has called us to do, someone's already been prepared to say yes to provide everything that we need for the ministry. Somehow, God talked to this donkey owner that if someone asks you for this donkey, give it to the master. The Holy Spirit is right now preparing others to support the ministry he's called you and I to do. Our responsibility is to do just like the disciples did and just go as God sends us. The scripture also said that he sent two disciples and we see this pattern that when God sends us out, he sends us two by two. There's a, there's a principle in scripture that has to do with two. It says, um, wherever two agree on earth, it shall be done. We could ask any, wherever two agree, wherever two or three are gathered in his name, he is there. God will always send, out us, send us out in agreement. And when we go out there and do what God asks us to do, this is what we're going to find. We're going to find exactly what he said would happen. Did they find the donkey? They sure did. Did they get the donkey? They sure did. Our responsibility is just to continue saying yes. And that means it will turn out exactly the way he said it would. And all the provision for the mission will always be there as well. So they find the donkey, they bring it to Jesus, and now Jesus, Jesus, people came and they put a clothes on the donkey, and now Jesus sits on the donkey and begins to enter Jerusalem. He doesn't, again, come in as a conquering king, he comes as a humble servant ready to make peace. In, in those days when a leader would come in on a donkey, it would represent he came to bring peace. And that's exactly what Jesus came to do. He came to bring us peace, peace with him. We no longer need to be enemies of God because Jesus has done everything that he needed to do to conquer our sin so we could be forgiven and enter into relationship with the Lord. The people, as he enters, they begin to praise him. And let's look at that. In verse 9, Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, praise God, 
Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in highest heaven. You know what Jesus does? He accepts their praise. In another portion of scripture, the Pharisees or religious leaders were really upset that he was accepting praise. And Jesus said, if they don't praise me, the rocks will praise me. Jesus was accepting praise because he was truly the Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He was the one that was going to die for our sins and to resurrect from the dead. He was also accepting praise because he is God as well. So let's go on to the script uh, in the scripture and we find in verse 12 the next morning as they were leaving Bethany Jesus was hungry and he noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off so he went over to see if he could find any figs but there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit then Jesus said to the tree may no one ever eat your fruit again and the disciples heard him say that. This scripture is very, it's very interesting because as you look at the scripture, you say, well, this doesn't make sense. He, he's hungry. He's going to a fig tree and the fig tree has no fruit. That's not the problem. The problem is that it wasn't a season for the tree to bear fruit. So literally, Jesus was looking for, a, for figs on a tree and it wasn't season the season for the fig tree to bear fruit. What does this represent? Well, this represents our lives. Many times in scripture, the Bible talks about trees and, and in Psalms one, it says, you'll be like a tree planted by the waters. And trees represent, represent every single one of us. Now a tree has a season where it be bears fruit, but we as believers, we're called to bear fruit in every season. We're supposed to be prepared in season, out of season, good times, bad times. And what God is saying with me, with Jesus, you can bear fruit in every season. And that's what Jesus was expecting. He showed up and he's the one that changes seasons. And now in our lives, we can trust if we have Jesus, this is the truth. We can bear fruit in every season. Now, there were some people that were leafy. And what I mean by that is, is that it looked like they should be very fruitful and they look healthy on the outside, but on the inside, they were not fruitful. And many of those people that Jesus was talking about or referring to in scripture were those Pharisees. And Jesus even said that they were like white sepulchers, really beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, they were rotten. There was no fruit. But we know this, that with Jesus Christ and only with Jesus Christ, can we bear fruit, love, joy, peace, kindness, self-control, goodness, all the fruits of the spirit, each one of us can bear with Jesus Christ. See, curse is a tree. Um, and later on, we're going to see what happened to that tree. Now, Jesus, to continue, as we continue in this chapter, he goes back into Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of, their, uh, of those selling doves. And he said in verse 17, he said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Now Jesus goes in there and he's, he looks at his temple, he looks at his church, and it's supposed to be a place that we connect with the Lord. But we find some people that were trying to take advantage of the times of sacrifice and selling animals at really extravagant prices, trying to make profit. And they lost the whole purpose of the temple was to connect with God. There were actually thieves there. A den of thieves was a place where thieves would come and gather, gather together, a place where they felt safe. So the thieves, it was like a bad neighborhood. <laughs> they would all come together and we feel safe here because we're all thieves. And imagine that thieves were coming into the temple of God and they were feeling really comfortable, no fear of God. And Jesus says, mm, we got to turn this over. And Jesus did, did come to turn the whole systems over because it was not working. 
their hearts were really far from God. They were acting religious and doing all the religious things, but they were not worshiping God. And that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to reestablish the relationship with God and man. And he was saying, we're turning this over. And in, and in the coming, <laughs> coming days, we're really going to turn this over. Because the only way to be saved and the only way to enter into a relationship with the Lord is through faith in Jesus Christ. Later on, we see in verse 20, the next morning, as, a, as the disciples passed by the same fig tree, he had cursed. The disciples noticed that it had withered from the roots. Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you curse has withered and died. This scripture is reminding us that one day, I want you to get this, one day every single one of us will stand before God in judgment. And there will be a declaration that's made over every single one of us. And I pray that you hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant. Because God has given us, each one of us, an assignment, and we were created to be fruitful in the Lord. I pray that you're, as you're listening to this, that you've given your life to Jesus. You do not want to be one of those people that say, Lord, Lord, I did miracles in your name. And he says, I never knew you. We can never be fruitful if this doesn't happen. We repent of our sins and place our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I never knew you because you were a, work of a, a worker of iniquity. What it means is these people began to do religious things, maybe even started going to church, but they never stopped sinning. They never repented of their sins. When I say stop sinning, what I'm saying is they never stopped practicing their sin. They continued in their sinful lifestyle, and then they started going to church and maybe even doing some good works. This fig tree reminds us of a day of judgment. And there will be a day that some of us will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, come celebrate with me forever in heaven. And there's going to be others that will be separated from God forever and ever and ever. And how sad that day will be because once the judgment has been spoken, it is literally over. There will be no second chances. And we as believers, that's why we're preaching the good news of Jesus Christ because tomorrow is not guaranteed for you and it's not guaranteed for them. There's a few things, there's two things that are going to happen that, that can't happen in heaven. One, or after we die. One, is that we cannot share our faith with anyone else. The second thing that can happen, no one can ever be saved after they die. The time for salvation and the time for sharing our faith is right now. Now, Jesus began to teach his disciples about this fig tree. And he says, look, have faith in God. What a wonderful statement. This is verse 22. Have faith in God. What he was saying is don't have faith in yourself and your good works. Don't have faith in religion. Have faith in God. Have faith, trust in him. I tell you, and this is what he said, I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt, doubt in your heart. Now Jesus is reminding them, look, what I did to that fig tree, I'm giving you the authority to do as well. The, the mountains represent problems, that, like huge problems that you think, I can't overcome this. And maybe you're facing a mountain in your life or an obstacle or a challenge that's beyond your ability, that's beyond your experience, that's beyond your knowledge, that's beyond your personal wisdom. That's what he says, have faith in God. It's impossible for you, but it's not impossible for God. And all he's saying is any obstacle or mountain that you're facing right now, when you have faith in God, you can overcome it. But what do we need to do? Exercise our faith. And he says, say to the mountain, speak to the mountain, speak life. Don't just speak mountain. What I mean by that? Don't just speak problems, speak solution. If someone's sick, it's okay to acknowledge they're sick. But why not say something like this? be healed in Jesus' name, or by his stripes, I am healed. Or if someone right now is not living for God, claim something in scripture. Say something like this, as for me and my house, 
we will serve the Lord. Everyone's going to get saved in my household. Or maybe you have financial problems. And you could speak to that mountain. Speak the word to that mountain. God will supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. Or you're struggling with an addiction. Don't just speak addiction. Speak freedom. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. That's how you speak to your mountain. Speak the word of God. And what's going to happen? Eventually, as you have faith, that mountain will be removed. I remember when my daughter was sick in the hospital with cancer. I couldn't just speak cancer. And I couldn't just repeat what the doctors were saying. I needed to do something about it. And I did my best. I did my part. I used my faith. And what I did is I prayed for my baby. I go, Lord Jesus, I know you're a healer, and I'm going to lay hands on her just like you said. We will lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. And I laid hands on her, and then I started proclaiming healing. I, start, I told her she was three years old. I go, Abriana, we're going to ask God for help. And you know what he's going to do? And she goes, what, Daddy? I go, he's going to help us. I go, let's pray and ask for help. Okay? So God is saying you could come to him and he goes, I tell you, you can pray for anything. In verse 24, if you believe that you received it, it will be yours. He's saying, believe it. If you're praying, if you believe it, without doubt, it's going to be yours. But then he goes into one last area about prayer in verse 25. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your father in heaven will forgive you of your sins too. Here we see two major points. Jesus is saying, have faith, and then he says, forgive. Have faith and forgive. Maybe one of the big obstacles or mountains you have in your way is unforgiveness towards somebody. And he's saying, if you continue to hold on to the unforgiveness, it's going to be a mountain that's going to be in the way or an obstacle that's going to be in the way of your prayers being answered. God is concerned about our hearts when we're praying. Not only that we have a heart full of faith, but also have a heart full of love. And if, if right now I say, I have a lot of faith, then he's saying, okay, do you need to forgive someone? Because if you don't forgive them, I want you to get this, I will not answer your prayer if you don't let it go. We forgive because he's forgiven us. Do you know this is all about relationships? Our relationship with God only happens because he chooses to forgive us and show us mercy. And your relationship with others matters, and you can only have great relationships as you forgive. So this is what he's saying. If you want prayers to be answered and you want to move mountains, then have faith and make sure that you're forgiven everyone that has hurt you. And it will continue, God's saying, then we'll continue with our relationship with the Lord. This, this, this chapter ends with a question from the Pharisees again that are always fighting the message of Jesus Christ. Jesus wants to give them the good news, that they could be saved, that they could be born again. But I guess these, these Pharisees and religious teachers are these fig trees that look really pretty on the outside, but they produce no fruit. And we could tell they produce no fruit because from the abundance of their heart, their mouth speaks. Now, again, Jesus entered Jerusalem, and they're st these, these religious leaders are upset that Jesus turned over the tables. And as Jesus was walking through the temple area, the leading priests and teachers of religious law and the elders came up to him and they demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right to do them? And Jesus says, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. If you answer one question, Jesus replied, did John's, author did John's authority to baptize come from heaven or was it merely human? Answer me. Now, I want you to understand that Jesus is not trying to avoid a question. He just knows that even, no matter how, much, how he answers these questions, they're not as, asking a question to get an answer. They're asking a question to argue with him. There's a portion of scripture that, say, a scripture that says, um, do not throw pearls to pigs. Jesus even said that. And what he's saying, he's not saying that people are worthless. What he's saying is there's some people that you give them the pearls of God's wisdom and his love and his message, and they will not appreciate them. And what he's saying, don't waste your time talking to people that do not appreciate the message that you're trying to get the good news message. Maybe at that time they're not ready. And you might have to tell them, it looks like you're not quite ready yet. But when you're ready, I'll be ready to share with you. So Jesus asked them, 
okay, you guys believed in John the Baptist, right? You know what he said? He said, I'm the Messiah. <laughs> he said, I'm the Savior. Do you believe him? And since they didn't want to confirm that Jesus was the Messiah, they said, well, we don't know what authority John the Baptist said what he said. So Jesus said, okay, well then, I won't tell you from what authority that I have come. This is what he said. Then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. And what things was he doing? He was actually taking authority over the temple, overthrowing the money changers. He was doing miracles. He was casting out demons. And the truth was, there was only two authorities. Either he was doing it under the authority of the Lord, God, or he was doing it under the authority of Satan. And the truth was, he was doing it under the authority of God. And I pray that as you heard, as you, we went through this chapter, um, Mark chapter 11, that you've received, that you're receiving Jesus. As maybe even as they began to receive him as he came in, they began to welcome him as he entered in Jerusalem. I pray that you're like the disciples as he's giving you simple instructions. Don't try to figure everything out. Just follow the instructions and the provision will be there and the vision will come to pass. Or maybe you're the person that right now, man, I'm facing a huge mountain. I don't know what to do. And God is saying, have faith in God, not yourself, not circumstances, not the economy, but have faith in God. And you can pray about anything. And if you believe, you'll receive it. Or maybe you just need God's authority over your life. You're wondering, man, is Jesus the Lord? Is he the Savior? And he is. Today's your day to accept him. Do not take on the attitude of these these Pharisees and religious leaders that constantly were questioning Jesus and not receiving anything from him. Because if you believe in him, you can not only be forgiven, you can have eternal life. I, I pray that the end of your life does not turn out that, like that fig tree. That at the end he says, I don't know you. This is your opportunity to know him as your Lord and Savior. Right now, tomorrow's not guaranteed. It's a simple prayer. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Call on Jesus to save you today. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I need you to save me. I desire to be fruitful. I want to fulfill your purpose in my life. I want to be like those disciples. Wherever you send me, I'll go. I want to see your will be done in my life. Forgive me. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I receive the gift of eternal life. And I thank you when you see me you're going to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant, because I want to serve you the rest of the days of my life. If you said that prayer and you meant it, you're saved. It's the beginning of your new walk with God. And for us as believers, let's go ahead and share the good news of Jesus Christ because time is running out. And we know Jesus is coming back, not on a donkey. When he comes back, he's going to come on a white horse. And when he comes, he's going to come to save all his people but also bring judgment on the enemy. We love you. God bless you. Thank you again for tuning in to our daily growth book review of chapter 11. And next week will be chapter 12. God bless you. Love you. <laughs>